The problem in the Seattle metro area is if you want to be safe, you have to pay for it. As crime soars to new heights, Seattle police staffing is at an historic low. We're at 880. That is a stunning number. Leading businesses to pay for their own protection. Nobody wants to be spending those dollars, but they're necessary investments. We go inside the secretive world of private security. I don't give a when you being a police and discover that Amazon has more officers than SPD. I don't think that the private industry could survive without private security. This spotlight brought to you by Beacon Plumbing. Good evening and welcome to the spotlight. I'm David Rose and we begin tonight in downtown Seattle with a notorious corner. There's a tapestry of trouble and the embodiment of several public safety issues that we've tackled in recent weeks right here on the spotlight. Third and Pike. Just two short blocks from one of Seattle's most iconic landmarks, where every summer tourists flock to see fish tossed through the air. The stretch of Third Avenue between Pike and Pine is known on the streets as the Blade. It's also a market, but not the kind you want to visit with your kids or stroll through with out-of-towners. In a lot of ways, as a city, we've sort of given over the public real estate, the sidewalks, the alleys, the parking spaces, to commercial crime and to drug trafficking. And they're utilizing our own public areas to run businesses. Until last week, Third and Pike was a booming open-air drug bazaar, where young gang members worked as vendors doling out fentanyl-laced pills to homeless addicts, and where catch and release has been in full effect with deadly consequences. Two murders in a span of three days helped change that, at least for now. In the middle of the afternoon on Sunday, February 27th, Reno Mayava was gunned down on the crowded street. Then on Wednesday, 15-year-old Michael Del Bianco was shot and killed. Sources telling the spotlight his shooting is the latest bloodshed in a long feud between gangs, the Hoovers who were trying to muscle in on the downtown drug trade, and Central District gangster disciple and Piru Sets. Those three days of madness forced newly elected Mayor Bruce Harrell to take a stand. We sort of inherited a mess. United with City Attorney Ann Davison, King County Prosecutor Dan Satterberg, the head of the DEA Seattle Field Office, Frank Tarantino, and U.S. Attorney Nick Brown, the mayor announced Operation New Day, arrests first and services second. One of the best times, unfortunately, to treat someone with drug and alcohol issues, as an example, could possibly be when they're arrested. I know that sounds like an interesting way to approach it. The city says it's worked already at 12th and Jackson, where stolen goods and drugs were being sold in broad daylight. Now, SPD is running two mobile command units and doing emphasis patrols. One in the International District at 12th and Jackson, the other at 3rd and Pike. But can it keep up those efforts with current staffing? Or will it just be a frustrating game of whack-a-mole? As the drug trade sets up shop at another bus stop, SPD tells the spotlight that the department has 950 deployable officers available for duty. But the Seattle Police Officers Guild says that number is actually much lower. We're at 880. That is a stunning number that obviously the department's not going to comment on, but we will. By comparison, Boston, which is roughly the same size in square miles and slightly smaller by population, has 2,143 officers. So with law enforcement resources stretched historically thin in Seattle, many companies have turned to private security. We spoke with John Scholes from the Downtown Seattle Association, an organization that represents 2,000 businesses. A majority of property owners have their own contracts for private security. Certain retail businesses and street level businesses have their own contracts for private security. And everybody's spending more than they've ever spent before. They don't like it, they don't want to be doing it, but they feel it's necessary to have a safe environment for their workers and for their customers. It's hard to know exactly how many security workers there are in Seattle because the security industry keeps things close to the vest. Securitas, based in Sweden, has an army of 100,000 operatives across the United States. They handle everything from armed security to online investigations. Securitas has a major footprint in our region. Based out of its headquarters next to SeaTac Airport, Securitas provides security and detective services to Amazon, Microsoft, and Fox 13. 
It was a Securitas agent working protection for our news crew during the 2020 Seattle riot who wrestled a stolen AR-15 away from an anarchist. Securitas declined to comment for this story. So did Amazon. Amazon has around the clock security for some executives and its city within a city campus of 40,000 workers in South Lake Union. But SEIU Local 6, the union that represents Amazon security workers, puts the number at more than 1,000, giving Amazon a force roughly the same size as SPD, although not all of them are armed. In total, SEIU Local 6 represents more than 4,000 union security officers in Seattle. It's an unprecedented boom time for private security in Seattle, with some companies telling us there's a waiting list for clients needing armed protection, something the owner of one company tells us is good for business, but bad for society. And the problem in the Seattle metro area is if you want to be safe, you have to pay for it. The man you heard from there is a sworn officer in Georgia, but he also owns a security firm right here in Washington state where he spends part of the year because business is booming. He allowed our cameras to tag along as he patrolled client properties. And as you'll see, it didn't take long for things to get dicey. This alleyway, we see a lot of violence in. That's why we do a lot of patrols. Uh, Central District Unit, be advised there were shots fired on third and In the last week, there's been a shooting, uh, a stabbing, and then this morning, there was a person held at gunpoint right back there, right where we just passed. We regularly find people just sitting here, you know, strung out. We'll make sure they're alive you know, make sure they're breathing. A um, lot of vehicle break-ins for the residents. Um, so even though the, the businesses here are our primary concern, increasing the safety of the area um, increases the safety of the, the client sites. So we do a lot of, a lot of area checks back here. I know for us, um, we have turned down more work in the last month than we have actually taken. Every single day I'm getting a call or an email from somebody saying, hey, we need you guys, we need you guys. Um, and most of them are saying, hey, we need you to start tomorrow. We need a full-time contract in place tomorrow. Um, and that just, it, it's not realistic with the amount of calls. You, you can't staff that, not with the training that's required to put somebody in the field for us. Kind of the things that we're looking out for, just suspicious behaviors, or you come in when your hazard's on, park directly in front of the door. Doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong, it just means we're gonna go talk to you and figure out what you're doing. The minimum requirements are four years, either four years of armed security or four years of military service or two years of uh, law enforcement or corrections. Um, we'll accept any of those. <laughs> so we teach criminal law, constitutional law. We go over use of force. We go over case law and case review. We do defensive tactics, and then we take them out to the field training. You know, somebody calls me, I can't provide a service. I refer them to our partner companies, our friends uh, that we've worked in good, good relations with. Uh, and they can't service them. So what do they do? They have to have service. They want security. So they end up calling with somebody. What's up? Leave him alone, sir. What are you doing? Leave him alone. Buy me my father, man. OK. Leave him alone. Leave him alone. You doing all right, man? Leave him alone. Leave him alone. Leave him alone. You good? Why are you recording this? What? He's, he's recording me. Bro, the, I ain't recording nothing. I'm getting killed for nothing. Go, go. I saw that issue. What the you. Okay. Watch your back. Watch your back. Watch your back. Watch your back. So he's a local. Um, he's a little, little not all in the head, but uh, he's harmless. He, he'll yell at you and scream at you. But if you actually, you know, have to deal with him, he, he was really harmless. Um, but that's just you know, welcome to Olive Oil. Um, the. Yeah, the the problem is people will go to somebody that can provide the service, and they'll they'll skip. The problem with my dude. What? How you, how you doing? Good. I don't give a when you being a police. We're not police. We're security. What you are? I said, is there a problem? There ain't no problem. What's the problem? I don't give a about you being a police or a cop or nothing that. Okay. Have a good night. We're just talking, me and him. You know what? He caught the red light. Not a good thing. Yeah. Can't move. Yep. I can. Yep. My pistol's it, it sparks just like yours, sir. Yep. You have a good night, all right? You too. God bless you guys. All right. So he's another local, but he's a little bit more dangerous. Um, he usually has a gun on him, 
And he'll usually tell you like he just did us. He'll tell us he's got a gun on it. I've never seen him actually um, use it on somebody. Um, we have had two incidences. He's been arrested before because um, he's been standing in the intersection with a gun. And uh, one of those instances, we, we did take action because, again, our client's site is on that corner. He was waving a gun around the intersection. So that's, that's something where we're going to act because that bullet could potentially strike our client or a customer of our client. Uh, so that's something where we would actually take action. We detain that person and wait for Seattle PD to, to show up. That's how quickly a mundane situation can escalate on the street. So how do you prepare for that? The spotlight hits the training course. You want something? I got something for you. Hey, stay back. Hey, we can settle this like gentlemen. Welcome back to the spotlight. How a person reacts in those fight or flight situations is a matter of life or death. And that's why Jacob Bradley leads his security teams through monthly use of force scenarios. Our cameras bring you the action from his undisclosed training location. We do role playing or acting actressing professionally. Um, so we pay them to come out and, and role play for us. And they do a very good job. Uh, security officer number one, you received a call from the manager of the cannabis location. She's requesting security to remove a shoplifter gentleman apparently attempted to reach across the counter and steal product. Subject is still on site. No weapon seen. In this particular case, what they don't know uh, is there's going to be a physical altercation between the gentleman who's going to be acting as the employee uh, and then this gentleman who is the person who attempted to shoplift. Um, and then uh, they're going to get into an altercation. At some point, uh, the manager is going to come out and decide to defend her uh, employee with a firearm, at which case the officers are either going to have to make a decision to uh, use lethal or non-lethal force to try and contain that situation. Uh, so we'll see what they do. Hey, stop, stop, security, stop, stop. What's going on? Stop, stop, sit down. What's going on? What's your name? Are you okay? Fine. Do you need first aid? No. What's your name? Joe. Joe? How do you know him, Joe? He started hitting me for no reason. Okay. You should probably tase him. I'm not gonna do that. One of two things. We want to make sure that they separate the two parties. In this particular situation, he, he positioned properly and he moved towards the threat. Um, so we waved off the, the role player for the weapon. And at this point, this is where we would, uh, we're just gonna break the scenario and wait for the police at this point. Scene secure, our job's done. Uh, we're just gonna wait, collect information, and hand it over to law enforcement. So that's what we're gonna call break. Break! For this one, uh, we're going to get into a little bit more of a, uh, a use of force, don't use force situation. We're basically going to make them have to use a use of force decision. That's not your wife's purse, that's my purse. Give me back my freaking purse. Hey, stop. Hey, this is my purse, he just stole this from me. You want something? I got something for you. Hey, stay back. Hey, we can settle this like gentlemen. That's her purse. Just have her open. Stay back. I'm back. We're gonna get this figured out. We, we can get this figured out. We can get this figured out. Hey, stop. Do not approach. Stop. 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 Hey, hey, hey. Just hey, look do it. Stop. They're taking care of it. I don't even understand why he took it in the first place. It's got all of my stuff yeah, in it. Harder. Stop. He's got a gun. Um, hey, he's fucking uh, your boy here. Drop the gun. Drop your gun. Okay. Okay. Put it down. Okay. Now. Okay. Back down. away. Down. Back away. Why aren't you guys arresting him yet? Like, I'm he took my stuff. You're just gonna let him go? I had her shouting, you know, why is he not in cuffs? Why is he not in cuffs? Because that's a very normal thing for people who feel they just got robbed to say. That's exactly what you should have done. He's fine. You know, even even verbally tell him, hey, look, man, don't worry about her. We got her. She's not gonna hurt you. You're not gonna hurt her. All that stuff. Open and shut case. Good, good job on the no use of force, you know. Again, deadly weapons present, but just because there's a deadly weapon present doesn't mean we're gonna deploy deadly force. You know, we're gonna give them those verbal commands, we're gonna give them that opportunity to comply, and if they comply, ultimately, we're gonna walk away from that situation and without even really having to secure anybody. Um, you know, good job. Up next, the heart-wrenching toll of the violence at Third and Pike. What a grieving grandmother wishes she'd done differently. Parents don't wanna listen to their kids when they're talking to their friends. I wish I would have. Michael Del Bianco was just a kid. He spent 15 years on this planet before a bullet ended his life on Third Avenue. He was raised by his grandmother. Michael called her mom. She says that she confronted him about rumors of gang activity after he started school at Todd Beamer High in Federal Way. But she says 
he denied it. I was like, what are you doing? I heard, and he's like, Mom, that's not true. You know, I mean, he would never want to break my heart, I guess, you know. And he just said, I'm fine, I'll be good. I just don't know what he was doing down there. I mean, he, the last four months, you know, we really didn't see hiding her hair of him. I hear different stories, but Michael's my son and he is a good boy to me. He was a normal, you know, normal kid, you know, playing football and doing what he needed to do. And then, I don't know, when he turned 15, it was just a big stepping stone for him. And I think he was just trying to find, find himself. The last two years have been really hard on all the kids. And I think maybe being trapped inside the house for so many, you know, for years. There was a group of kids, I guess, that he, uh, he met. I don't know any of them. Michael kept that part of his life away from me. I would just wish that I would have listened, you know, Parents don't want to listen to their kids when they're talking to their friends. I wish I would have. I wish I would have been able to see who he was really hanging out with. But that doesn't make me love him any less. And I still, if I can save one child from the streets, I want to do whatever I can. Still ahead, the deadly one block area where Michael was shot to death claims another homicide victim and leaves his fiance desperate for answers. We need help so we can stop this from happening. It's easy to look at stories of violence on the news and judge the victim based maybe on their appearance or their background, but it's not fair. Even the most troubled people have loved ones who care about them. And one of those is Reno Mayava, shot to death on a crowded corner at 3rd and Pine in Seattle on Sunday, February 27th. His fiance reached out to me for help to get justice for Reno because no arrest has been made. What's the hardest part right now? Knowing that I will never hold him again. I'll never kiss him again. I can't tell him I love him. It's not fair. And you don't have any answers either. I have no answers. I need justice for Reno and his family, myself and my family. He was very loved. Tell me about your relationship with Reno. I've been with Reno off and on for seven years. It's been a roller coaster ride, I'm not gonna lie. When you look at his history, yes. he has a pretty significant criminal history of assaults. In one case, he almost killed a man in 1990 in Capitol Hill. He had a recent case in 2020, assault on a transit driver. Was this a violent guy? I never saw that side. Did I know it could be possible? Yes, but not to me. What is it that attracted you to him? What did you love so much about him? His personality, his, just the way he was. He was real. He was down to earth and he was just good people, good heart. But the last couple of years have been hard on the relationship and I think on both of you, right? Yes. Yeah, why is that? Reno, <laughs> his mental illness, it's not taking the medications, it's self-medicating, you know, stuff like that. that it, you know, it turns him into somebody that he's not and that's hard to deal with on a daily basis. Was it possible for him to stay somewhere? I know he wasn't living here with you at the time, but what, what did his mental illness sort of prohibit him from wanting to just have a, a very normal life? I don't think that he knew how. Um, I think uh, between being locked up so long and having the mental illness that he had, I just don't think he could I don't think he could figure that out. You know, um, he stayed with me for um, a couple years. He stayed with his brother, you know, and he does well for a while and, and, and then things happen. I feel like you have a very particular and important voice 
for other families who have loved ones that are hanging out down in this area and other areas where there's a lot of criminal activity. Um, and it shows that the, those people, a lot of those people are not thrown away by society. They have people that care about them. Right, they do. They just need to get away from there. Yeah. What's the solution, do you think? Counseling, help, whether it's medication, whether it's needing somebody to talk to, whether it's a rehabilitation of some sort, they need help. And when Reno got help, for example, at Western State Hospital, he would do better for a while. He was absolutely wonderful there. He actually told me he really liked it there um, because he could come and go, you know, after you go through a certain period, you know, you, could, you get to come and go and see your family. And, and he liked the structure. Reno needed structure. And if he didn't have that, this is what would happen. How do you think things are going in our state right now? horrible it's falling apart we need our police back we need people to come together everybody's just ripping apart nobody cares about anything no, there's no funding there's no help for people we need help so we can stop this from happening you know it's not fair to, to Reno or to anybody else not just Reno Anybody else, anybody that that guy is going to go do that again to. I want to save everybody. You want his death to mean something. Y yes, and it is and it will. Bless your heart, I can't make you cry anymore. Give me, give me a hug. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry.